Great. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, diabetes and in particular pre-diabetes. Um, uh, for those of you that I think probably most of you don't know me. My name is Bill Lombard. I'm a retired nephrologist. I was in practice in Bellingham for about 38 years until I retired a couple of years ago. And you might say, well, what's a kidney specialist doing talking to us about diabetes? Well, it turns out diabetes plays a very significant role in kidney disease. And in fact, more than half of the people that are on dialysis are on dialysis because of diabetes. Consequently, this is a disease that's very close to my heart. I saw many people suffer the ravages of this disease at that stage of their life. And um, anything I can do to prevent that, um, I would consider uh, to a benefit to others. Um, so prediabetes, uh, just a brief look at that initially, is um, it's been kind of considered uh, like light diabetes. And I think people, in fact, I can recall maybe even myself years ago saying to someone when they had a diagnosis of prediabetes or mild elevated blood sugar was like, well, you know, your sugar's a little elevated, maybe you need to keep an eye on that. And what we know now is that prediabetes is not the least bit benign. And it is something that we need to uh, be concerned about. And more importantly, it is one of the rare circumstances where we have a disease that we can actually turn the course of back to normal with non-medical means, just with lifestyle changes, and also save those individuals all the heartache of the problems with diabetes further on. So um, next slide, please, Elaine. Um, whoops. Uh, sorry, hold on. <laughs> okay. um, let me try that again. Too many. Okay. Oh, back one. So how many of you are afraid of sharks? Um, I don't like sharks. And after seeing the movie Jaws, which I suspect maybe some of you did years ago, I have a, I know I had a friend that wouldn't even go in a lake after that. Next slide, please. But as it turns out, risk of a shark attack is like one in 11.5 million, but the risk of having prediabetes is one in three. So if you look at the gallery that we're sharing today, you look to the person to your left and the person to your right, one of you is at risk for having prediabetes, which is a huge, huge number when you look at it. Next slide, please. So first, let's talk about diabetes and look at the size of that problem since we're, that's the disease we're trying to prevent um, by treating prediabetes. So in 1990, 10 million Americans were 3.6% of the population had diabetes. In 2018, 34.5 million or 10.5% of Americans had diabetes. And that's a threefold or 300% increase. And if you look at uh, adults with diabetes today, seven and a half million or 21% are, are undiagnosed. And those are the ones that typically have had pre-diabetes where they were thought, well, I have a little bit of problem with my blood sugar, but it's not such a big deal. And they slowly morph into type two diabetes. And during that time, they're accruing significant vascular disease um, and vascular injury because of it. So this is a huge problem. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, next slide, please. First of all, is everyone able to hear me okay? Okay, so. Um, sometimes they have problems with my um, audio before in the past. This slide is an interesting county uh, level prevalence of diagnosed diabetes for the years um, 2004, 2008, and 2016. And what I like about this slide is it graphically shows, and the darker the colors, as you can see along the middle line, the darker the colors, the um, higher the prevalence, that is the people at any one time um, having diabetes. And you can just see how this is gradually but dramatically increased over this uh, what 12 year period of time. And even if you look up at uh, Whatcom County, way up there in the top left corner, we did really back in 2004, 
we had a low incidence or percentage with um, diabetes around somewhere in the 1.5 to 6.9 percent. Um, we then went up to about uh, the 7 to 8.5 and have stayed there. If you look um, in the next um, period of 2006, it's closer to 8.5. So we are not spared from this. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the drivers of this dramatic increase in diabetes? Well, uh, first off is the nat national and actually global increase in obesity in the United States. 73.6% of the population is overweight and 42.5% are actually uh, categorized as obese based on uh, BMIs. Secondly, there's been a over the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a progressive increase in high caloric diets, that is diets that are high in fat and carbohydrates, which are the, probably the worst combination in terms of contributing to, di to diabetes and vascular disease. Uh, sedentary lifestyles have become increasingly common uh, and we have an aging population. And um, the, the truth of the matter is that diabetes is more common as we get older. Next slide, please, Elena. So how is this spread out amongst age groups? Well, the prevalence of diabetes in Americans over the age of 65 is 26.8%, uh, obviously significantly higher than what we saw for the general population, which is closer to around 10. Um, how about in youths? Well, there's been also a dramatic increase in type 2 diabetes amongst the younger population, which has increased about almost 100-fold or 100% from 2001 to 2017. When I was in training, now granted that was a long time ago, um, it was virtually um, a rare occurrence to see someone under the age of 20 with type 2 diabetes. Most of those individuals had type 1, which is the autoimmune form of um, diabetes where the insulin producing cells are damaged or destroyed. Uh, and of course, this increase is related to the increase in diabetes amongst their younger population who seem to also share in these same four features that contributing to this. Next slide, please. And this just is a, a, a graph that demonstrates the change in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes amongst um, those under the age of 20. You can see that type 2 diabetes has gone from about 8% up to 18% as of 2016 in the um, Projections now are that it's probably above 15%. Next slide, please. Um, before we go on to this point, I just want to ask, are there any questions? Um, if so, you can either unmute yourself and ask them now, and we can all share them, or we can do it at the end, or you can put them in the chat box. Those are the two ways we can do questions, but it, this is sort of a little bit of a break point to see if anyone has any questions. Uh, and I will take, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat. I'm not sure. What is the difference between prediabetes and diabetes? Thank you, Steve, for that question. That's a great question, Stephen. We're going to talk about that a little more because um, prediabetes is really just a difference in the blood sugar level. And we'll, uh, I'm hoping to address that shortly. Okay, but great question. anybody else so we can go ahead and go on do you want the next slide okay yeah oh no i'm sorry stop with this so <clears throat> there also are uh health disparities amongst who gets diabetes and these all get down to um the social determinants of health which which we are most most of us i'm sure are familiar they include ethnic and cultural differences which result in dietary changes and whether or not um, obesity is accepted or not, uh, differences between the sexes, um, that relates to both behavioral and activity levels probably, access to healthcare plays an important role, uh, and of course lack of health insurance uh, leads to lack of um, access to healthcare in many circumstances. Food insecurity is a big issue because healthy, fresh, fruits, vegetables, and uh, are much more expensive than uh, high caloric foods. And consequently, those that have food insecurity end up going towards the, um, the lower cost foods, which are uh, not uh, the most favorable. 
language barriers present pe prevent people from uh, learning what they can do about uh, their weight, about their diet. Uh, and of course, homelessness is impacted by all those above it. Next slide, please. As a consequence of these dis disparities uh, in healthcare, there also are differences um, by race and, race and ethnicity. So for non-Hispanic whites, it's 7.5%. Asian Americans, 9.2%. 125 for Hispanics. 11.7 uh, for non-Hispanic Blacks and 14.7 or twice that of the average white person for American Indians and Alaskan Natives. And a lot of this is uh, genetically mediated as much as anything else. There's extremely high uh, rate of diabetes amongst the Hopi Indians in Arizona. It's closer to about 25%. Next slide, please. So, Steve, this gets to your question of uh, how do you make the diagnosis of diabetes versus prediabetes versus normal? These are the three commonly utilized blood tests um, to test for, di for diabetes. First is the fasting plasma or flask fasting blood sugar. That's present on any chemistry screen that you would obtain uh, from your physician. Uh, normal is less than 100, above 100 to up to 126. And it's interesting, many times you'll see advertisements for finger stick glucose monitors, and they show 120, which interestingly is kind of right in the prediabetes range. But anyhow, 100 to 126 is considered prediabetes, and above 126 is, or 126 or above is considered um, in the range of, di of frank diabetes. The next test that is commonly used is called the A1C hemoglobin, and this measures the percentage of hemoglobin, which is in red cells, which have an excess amount of glucose attached to them. Under 5.7 is considered normal. 5.7 to 6.5 is considered prediabetic. And those that are uh, equal to or above 6.5 are frank diabetes again. The third test is not very commonly used anymore. This is an oral glucose tolerance test. In this case, the individual is given a liquid drink that has exactly 75 grams of carbohydrate which is rapidly absorbed and then the blood sugar is tested at two hours and again uh, if it's uh, less than 140 it's considered normal 140 to 200 prediabetes and above 200 is, di is diabetes but again I, I have not seen this used very commonly so the first two of the two that we would would focus on for making a diagnosis of diabetes uh, next slide, please, Elena. So no matter, um, the end point of these ends up being the same. That is a significant chronically elevated blood glucose. Um, let's take a step back. Uh, insulin is the mediator of blood sugar levels in our body and is the great storage hormone. Whenever we take in a carbohydrate meal, uh, it stimulates the pancreas to release insulin. Uh, insulin is produced by the beta cells in the uh, pancreas. The insulin then <clears throat> directs what happens to that excess glucose we take in. If you have a meal that is mostly protein, the insulin level is not going to go up very much. If you take in a, a, a large carbohydrate meal, insulin levels will go up. And the body has this excess load of glucose, which it knows is an extremely important energy source. So it will stick it into uh, muscles and liver as a readily usable form of glucose storage called glycogen. Um, if those stores are already full, and those would be full because someone has not been active, if they've been active, they would have burned up that, some of that glycogen or broken it down during periods of activity when they weren't eating. And then it will put it into fat cells as fat. Uh, it also goes into uh, creating elevations in the triglyceride level in the blood and also cholesterol production. Um, so that's, that's basically what happens with diabetes, which is there's inadequate insulin for the glucose loads we receive. Type 1 diabetes, which used to be called juvenile, and now it's just simply called type 1, is actually an autoimmune destruction of these beta cells. And this, there is, uh, this is usually 
a combination of someone having the right genetic predisposition and then becoming infected with perhaps a virus, which is what is believed most commonly, which then shares a, uh, an, an antigen or some means with the beta cells so that they're destroyed by the immune response to that virus. Um, interestingly, um, this is the same mechanism which causes diabetes in those that get COVID-19. And uh, it's probably not quite the same thing, but there's something about the COVID um, coronavirus infection, which leads to an inflammatory response in the pancreas, which destroys the beta cells. So that's type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a much more complex disease. It is a combination of progressive loss of insulin secretion and insulin resistance. And the insulin resistance means that even when you have good insulin levels, your blood sugar is still not controlled. And this has to do with end organ um, metabolism, which is disordered. That is the fat cells have a resistance to the effects of insulin because there's an excessive number of fat cells because many of these people suffer from being overweight or obese. Um, the insulin can't service all the receptors on the fat cells. So no matter how much insulin you have, it's not enough to keep the blood sugar controlled. And then what happens over time is the pancreas basically fatigues and can no longer make insulin. Um, gestational diabetes is a uncommon disorder, but it happens in women during pregnancy. Um, it, in those particular individuals, it seems to be a predisposition, again, probably genetically mediated and perhaps associated with some um, weight related issues. But after the delivery of their child, the diabetes typically goes away. However, those women over time are at a very high risk for going on to develop diabetes later, type 2 diabetes later. And then there are other less common forms of diabetes. Um, there's rare um, meaning, monogenetic meaning there's a single gene mutation and those individuals do not uh, manufacture insulin normally. And those are usually uh, manifest early in, in infancy. Anything that damages the pancreas, such as pancreatitis, including cystic fibrosis, can lead to uh, diabetes. And uh, in my experience, those diseases which damage the pancreas extensively, like um, pancreatitis or repeated bouts of pancreatitis, are some of the most difficult to treat because they have no, um, none of the uh, counterbalancing hormones associated with insulin. And then there are certain medications which uh, can lead to diabetes. Prednisone is a very common one, which is used as an anti-inflammatory drug for certain diseases. And then there are some other immunosuppressive drugs like those used for transplantation, which can cause diabetes. Uh, I know there's a bunch of information to digest. Anyone have any questions about those that we'd want to talk about? And you, you guys can um, unmute if you have a specific question for Dr. Lombard as well. I think we can continue. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. So what, what is the, um, what makes diabetes so devastating? Well, it's the severe life-changing complications of the disease. The root mechanism of that is that prolonged elevation of blood sugars results in damage to the very small arterioles and capillaries in, in many organs. <clears throat> so in the eye, there can be damage to the retina, but also because of the vascular changes, glaucoma is very common, and also uh, because of the high blood sugars, cataracts develop commonly. And as a consequence, diabetes is the um, leading cause of new blindness in adults um, around the world and in our country, certainly. Kidney disease, as I mentioned before, uh, diabetes is the number one cause of that. Again, it's caused by the prolonged elevation of blood sugar, damming the, the, um, both the filters and the blood vessels. A very painful and subsequently um, uh, loss of feeling neuropathy develops in patients with long-standing diabetes. And again, this is because of the small blood vessels that service the nerves. And over time, this is a, can be a very disabling problem associated with disease. 
The larger blood vessels, consequently macrovascular, are also uh, damaged from diabetes, both from blood sugar, but also because of the associated increase in triglycerides and cholesterol and inflammation associated with the disease. Consequently, strokes <clears throat> are uh, a leading cause of disability in patients with diabetes. Heart attacks, and in fact, cardiovascular death is the number one cause of death in patients with diabetes. Uh, and the large vessels to the legs oftentimes can be involved, which is a particularly problematic issue in patients who also have neuropathy, where their feet are numb and they can't tell when they have a sore on their feet. And then because the blood, ves the blood vessels are damaged and the blood flow is poor, um, those wounds don't heal. They end up causing um, significant infections and gangrene. And diabetes is the number one cause of lower limb loss due to amputations in our country as well. So really a devastating disease. Uh, next slide, please. So how are we doing as a whole in our country treating diabetes? Um, if you look at how well we meet targets of the A1C hemoglobin, blood pressure, and lipids, which are three of the key targets for these patients, at best we're doing about a third to a half. When you look at large populations of meeting that, only 14% of patients with diabetes actually have all three of these and have smoking cessation as well. Uh, cardiovascular risks have improved, um, mostly because of the uh, increased understanding that we need to identify these early and because we have medications which can help control those. But if you ask anyone that looks closely at diabetes, they're gonna tell you that the delivery system for treating diabetes in our country uh, is fragmented lacks good clinical information capabilities. Uh, the services are duplicated and often poorly um, administered. Next slide, please. Okay, so now let's talk about prediabetes. As of 2018, 88 million Americans ages 18 and older have prediabetes. Um, and the really worse, in fact, is only 10% or one in 10 of those people are aware of it. Uh, and as we mentioned before, that means that one in three of us are at risk for prediabetes. Next slide, please. So what is prediabetes? And this gets back to your question again, Steve. Another way to look at diabetes is um, it's prevent diabetes because this does represent an opportunity to turn around a disease and prevent it from proceed going from prediabetes to diabetes. In the past, I think many people thought, well, I have prediabetes and that's what I'm gonna have forever and it's not gonna be a big deal. But in fact, 50% of the people with prediabetes go on to develop type two diabetes. And additionally, during this time that they have prediabetes, they're already starting to accrue the vascular complications. And that's what makes prediabetes such a um, uh, almost frighteningly under um, Let's see, under uh, estimate of the of the problems with that disease. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> getting down to more specifics. Uh, so, what is prediabetes? It's blood sugar elevations that are above normal, but not high enough to be diagnosed as diabetes. As I mentioned, diabetes prediabetes is not benign. Uh, as we said, it, um, the majority will go on to develop diabetes type two diabetes within five years. Prediabetes as I mentioned, those contributes to the later complications of diabetes. It's an opportunity to make lifestyle changes that can prevent diabetes and its later complications. And of course, the sooner you know it, the sooner you can do something to manage it and prevent uh, developing type two diabetes. Next slide, please. This is just a reminder that just as type two diabetes has risen amongst youth, so is prediabetes. Again, the, uh, they're not as high as adults, but one in five kids in the age group of, or young adolescents in the, uh, or young adults, I should say, in the ages of 12 to 18 have prediabetes. And as he increases, it just progressively goes up higher to the closer to one point or one to three. Next slide, please. What are the risk factors? How would you, what would make you think you might have prediabetes? Well, certainly being overweight is the first. 
Second, over the ages of 45, um, as I mentioned earlier, as we get older, our pancreas tends to not work as well. Um, if you have a family member with type 2 diabetes, that increases your risk. If you note that you're physically less active than you were or ha have been that way the majority of the time, that increases the risk significantly. Any woman that has had gestational diabetes is at a significant risk for having prediabetes. And <clears throat> the unusual um, polycystic ovary syndrome is another standout, but again, it's a hormonally mediated um, cause of um, prediabetes, which can also go on to diabetes. Next slide, please. So let's say that I have a risk factor. How, how do I find out if I have prediabetes? Well, uh, the CDC has created a very convenient test, um, and we're going to go through that in a moment together, but <clears throat> it's also <clears throat> it's put out by the CDC on their website, but it's also um, supported by the American Diabetes Association. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. And this is an actual link, so um, if you want these slides, you can... Um, actually click on this and it'll take you directly to it or copy this down but this will take you to the test though we are going to take that test together very shortly in fact right now okay um you can probably do this in your head if you have a pen and paper or pen and or pencil and paper out you can do this <clears throat> so what i'm going to do i'm going to do this test score for myself as we go through and you can we can see what we do here so first off we start off with how old we are i'm over 60 so i over 60, you get three points for starters. That seems like a jip for those of us that are older. I don't think that's very fair. Okay, if you're a man, you get one also. So I've got four already. Next slide, please. Um, I don't don't have gestational diabetes, but if you did, you would get an extra point for that. Do you have a mother, father, or sibling that has diabetes? I don't, so I get nothing for that. Have you ever been diagnosed, diagnosed with high blood pressure? I don't, um, and uh, but you can score yourself one if you do have high blood pressure, uh, none if you don't, zero if you don't. Are you physically active? Um, eh, I'm going to say yes, um, but I think we have to all be honest about that. I'm going to go ahead for the sake of interest say no. So that's going to give me one for age, one for, three for age, one for male, and uh, one for inactivity. So it gives me five already. Next slide, please. Okay, and now disregard everything on the upper part of this for one through six. We've already talked about those. Next is the weight category. So the way this works is we have you identify your height on the column to the left in green, uh, minus five foot nine. And then you go over to your weight and actually um, 165. So I get zero. So if you don't fall into either of those other weight categories of one that give you one or two or three points, you get a zero. If you're in this, go to five foot nine inches, 169 to 202, you get one point. 203 to 269, wow, two points. 270 plus three points. That's impressive. That'd be an impressive weight, wouldn't it? Um, okay. So you then add up all your scores. So I get zero for this, but I've already got five points. And let's go to the next slide. If your score is five or higher, you, you are at an increased risk for having prediabetes and at a higher risk for subsequent developing type 2 diabetes. Okay, if you take the test and you are in that range, the next time you see your healthcare provider, or maybe not next time, just go ahead and do it now, you need to talk to them and say, hey, you know, I scored <clears throat> positive for a screening test for prediabetes, and I want to be checked to see if I have that. If you are African American, Hispanic, um, American Indian, Alaskan Indian, Asian American, or Pacific Islander, you're in an even higher risk. And if even if you score, I, if I were one, if I were in that ethnic or cultural group, I would add, say, if I had anything up to a three, I would go ahead and, and get tested for it. Next slide, please. Okay, so how are we going to find out if we have diabetes? We're going to get a blood test. We'll ask our provider to do that. Next slide, please. This is the same slide we looked at earlier, but I just have it up again now so you can see, I'm sorry, not next time. The same slide we looked at earlier, but this shows you 
when you would qualify for diabetes. As we mentioned earlier, if my fasting blood sugar on a root, like on a chem screen or routine chemistry test is up 126, then I qualify for having diabetes. Um, or from 100 to 126, I'm in the pre-diabetes range, which is what we're looking for now. If um, the A1C is 5.7 to 6.5, would be pre-diabetes, and I don't think we need to, none of us are going to get an oral glucose tolerance test. So those are the numbers that we're going to be looking for that would um, diagnose us with pre-diabetes. Next slide, please. And just to follow up on mine, I actually have my blood sugar tested, and it's okay. Um, this is the current recommendations for the American Diabetes Association for um, screening and testing. So screening is the test that we just took, and testing is actual blood testing. They recommend that um, basically uh, screening, that this is the CDC questionnaire, should be considered for uh, all asymptomatic adults. Uh, testing, that is actually checking the blood sugar or A1C, should be done at age 45 in all in people, regardless of how they score in the testing. Uh, they, they recommend testing, again, blood testing for prediabetes in asympt people without symptoms uh, at any age if their BMI is greater than 25 uh, or greater than 23 if they're um, Asian Americans uh, and if they have uh, any uh, one or any additional risk factors for diabetes. Let's say, for example, you have a family member with diabetes. If the tests are normal, they should be repeated at least every three years. Next slide, please. Um, additional recommendations are, again, the blood test we talked about at appropriate intervals. Um, importantly, if you are diagnosed with prediabetes or uh, when someone is diagnosed with prediabetes, they should be screened for cardiovascular risk factors, primarily lipid profiles. So since we know that cardiovascular disease is a very high, um, has a significant cause of mortality uh, in patients with diabetes. Uh, and overweight, obese children and adolescents with two or more of these risk factors should also be tested, not screened, but actually tested with blood tests just uh, for prediabetes. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one of my favorite all-time slides. This was the original study performed at the NIH back in the 90s, and it wasn't published until 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and it shows... Um, what happens to people with prediabetes when they um, are, are uh, in a diabetes prevention program, which simply looks at lifestyle changes. And they compared that with the same group or similar group, not the same group, uh, that were treated with the diabetic drug metformin, which helps improve how insulin is handled. So it improves uh, blood sugar control by changing metabolism. And then the other group had no change. So at four years, in terms of how many of these pre-diabetic folks actually developed um, diabetes, in the lifestyle-only change, it was around 20%, whereas in those who had no uh, medication or lifestyle instruction, uh, it was close to 40%. Uh, and with, even with medication, it was closer to 30%. So this was the first study that said, you know what, if you make these lifestyle changes, you can have a significant impact and prevent the development of diabetes in a substantial number of people. Uh, and the other thing they found early on was, that, for example, in the lifestyle changes, which are basically weight control, diet, and exercise. In weight control, it doesn't take a lot to have a significant impact and both either go back from, um, prediabetes to having completely normal blood sugar control and preventing the pro progression of diabetes. It can be as little as seven to 10 pounds and, and, and the metabolism of insulin and glucose change dramatically. Next slide, please. So the goals of diabetes prevention programs uh, are preventing and delaying the onset of diabetes. Uh, it can reverse prediabetes to normal glucose uh, levels and glucose metabolism um, by <clears throat> preserving the beta cells so that they continue to have the capability of making insulin long term that um, will, if the person 
goes on later to develop type 2 diabetes, uh, it is less likely that they would do so or less likely that they will have more difficult to control blood sugars. Um, it prevents and delays microvascular and cardiovascular complications. Again, you want the, the point, of, and the reason I put the asterisk here is to remind me to say that prediabetes is not benign. It's very common. A common scenario would be someone to be told, let's say, you know, you, Bill, you have prediabetes and um, you need to make some, you know, keep your eye on your blood sugars. And I go, okay, yeah, do I need medicine for it? And I say, they say no. So, okay, well, it can't be that important. And so I um, uh, go, okay, diet and exercise. Yeah, maybe I can do those later. That's one of the hard work is things we oftentimes want to put off. So, Time goes on, and five years is usually the period during which more than half of those people will develop frank diabetes. But you know what? They're not going to know it. A light doesn't go off and say, oh, by the way, now you have diabetes. And if I'm not careful in being tested, I'm going to miss that, that change. And I'm going to go an additional five, maybe 10 years with type 2 diabetes. And during this entire time of chronically elevated blood sugars, I'm going to accrue substantial vascular injury. When I was in practice in nephrology, as a kidney specialist, we had people come in who had no idea they had diabetes, but they were sent to see us because they had protein in their urine and were developing kidney failure. As it turns out, the cause of it was diabetes. And when you would tell them, they would go, oh yeah, I told I had to watch my sugar 10 or 15 years ago, but it didn't, I didn't seem like it was a big deal. Well, it is a big deal. And that's why prediabetes is so critically important. Um, so ultimately, we want to reduce the impact of diabetes on individuals by reducing the number that get it, but also the impact when anyone has diabetes and its complications, it impacts their family and impacts all of us. Next slide, please. This just shows you what, um, this was a study that was done in Sweden, looking at a thousand uh, people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who had prediabetes and what happened to them over time when they were not put in any particular program. What they found basically was that 22% reverted to normal blood sugar levels. And when they looked at those individuals, those are people that had uh, normal blood pressures, they had no heart disease, and they had been able to lose weight down to the a normal BMI. 13% progressed to diabetes, but 23% died during this time. And those were the individuals that were not able to control things. And the problem is that um, we talk about the complications of diabetes. Well, the reason a lot of these people don't go on to develop kidney disease, for example, is because they die of cardiovascular disease before that. So prediabetes is not benign. Next slide, please. This was um, from uh, the uh, National Institute of Health. Uh, diabetes prevention program trial in uh, the uh, early 200 or 2020, I think it was 2002. And they showed that the um, programs like the uh, YMC's diabetes prevention can actually prevent 20, 58% of the cases of type 2 diabetes. Very important. Next slide, please. So, um, we're kind of a diets are healthy uh, and can be used to treat diabetes, pre-diabetes. Well, there are diets that have <clears throat> eat, uh, that, that contain uh, more leafy green vegetables, like uh, those listed for you. Romaine, kale, spinach, collards, and chard. Uh, choosing lean proteins like fish and chicken and pork over beef uh, and other fatty meats. Um, fiber is good. It's a contains carbohydrates, but it's oftentimes, but it's very slowly metabolized, but also um, it actually helps the gut microbiome, which um, interestingly changes how insulin is handled. Um, you should try to drink eight, eight ounce glasses of water daily and uh, avoid sugary drinks and sodas. Uh, what I would say about the eight, eight ounce glass of water, if you have any reason not to do that because of either kidney disease or heart failure, do not do that. Uh, low carbohydrate grains like um, quinoa, oats, bulgur, and actually wild rice more than processed rice are, are good sources of fiber and protein. Um, healthy fats are good, such as you find in seeds, nuts, dark chocolate, that's good, avocados, and um, fatty fish 
Next slide, please. Cutting back on salt and salty foods is important in that mostly to prevent the development of hypertension, which dramatically aggravates all the vascular complications of diabetes. Uh, pay attention to portion sizes. You know, we don't always need a big scoop of some uh, of whatever the, the meal is we're, we're having. Um, try to fill up half the plate with uh, non-starchy vegetables. If you um, eat out and you don't eat it all, don't take it home. And significant, and importantly, reduce your overall intake of um, sugar and, and carbohydrates. Next slide, please. And if you have prediabetes, I would highly recommend enrolling in one of the diabetes prevention programs in town. The Y has a great program. Um, University of Washington, or Washington State University, excuse me, um, has a walk-in extension, which also is involved in that. And these are the numbers you can reach in. I suspect those of you on this um, Zoom are familiar with the, uh, the WISE Diabetes Prevention Program. Next slide, please. Okay, to summarize what we talked about today, and happy to have any kind of discussion after this that you'd like. Prediabetes affects one in three of us, which is huge. Most of us don't know we have it. It's a benign sounding, sounding disease, but it contributes significantly to the serious complications of diabetes down the road. Take the test, and if it's positive, talk to your healthcare provider. Um, Prediabetes offers a rare opportunity, rarely seen in our lives, to reverse a disease and actually prevent the development of a worse disease, and it would do so without taking medications. And if you have prediabetes, I would highly recommend enrolling in a diabetes prevention program to help turn that around. We, we just don't seem to do a good job with lifestyle changes on our own. And having a trained coach um, show us the way is certainly a much easier way to do so. Next slide. Sorry. I know. No problem. So this is my contact information. Uh, if you want to email me with questions or anything, I'm happy to um, have you do so. I'm also happy to share the slides with you. Um, and that's all I have to present formally, but I'm more than happy to open up for discussion and we can all engage in that together. Okay, so we are running right into, sorry about the... Um... The issues, the technical issues we had early on. So we started a little bit late. We're running up into our class time. Um, oops. Um, but I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Lombard, for the great presentation. We will have it on Virtual Y, hopefully today. Um, those of you who missed it can join us on Virtual Y. So if everybody could quickly say thank you, Dr. Lombard, for a great presentation. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lombard. You're welcome. Thank you so much.